Thank you for reading that scripture. The scripture from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 16, is what we are going to look at this morning. And, you know, the, we know that each and every one of us that are devoted to serving God, we are called a man of God or a woman of God. These are the people for whom the Bible was clearly written and put their principles in practice. And we see that from this section here, um, we get some good information that we as men of God need to understand. And we need to be thoroughly or completely furnished unto every good work according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And so that's kind of what we're going to look at here is Paul's instructions that he gives to Timothy in this section. And, you know, all others who would seek to please God. And he sums up the Christian experience or what it is to be a Christian here in this section of 1 Timothy. So I want us to take a look at this scripture. And as you can see from the sermon title, it is Flee, fight, uh, Flee Follow, Fight, and Focus. And that's what we are going to be looking at this morning. First of all, uh, as we look at this, we need to look at some things that we need to flee and it says that there at the first part of verse 11, where it says, But you, O man of God, flee these things. Um, pursue righteousness, but flee these things. Flee here means to be a fugitive or to run away from. It is the exact opposite of attracted to or pursuing something. We're talking about the exact opposite of that. So what are these things here that Paul has in mind when he is saying, flee these things? Well, he just talked about them, and you have to understand the verses that precede this uh, to understand the context of what he's saying. But he talks about this in chapter 6, starting in verse 3, where he says, if anyone teaches... Otherwise, and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourselves. So he just says it in, the, in these previous verses. What are these things that we need to withdraw from? What are these things that we need to get, get away from? Well, first we see in this section that teachers of a different doctrine, people who are teaching something different, if they are teaching something that is not in Scripture, we need to withdraw ourselves. And when he says here in verse 11, we need to flee these things, this is the first thing he's talking about. <coughs> if someone is teaching error and not teaching truth, we need to flee from them. Well, the second thing that we see is... Those who desire to be rich, verses 9 and 10. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through many sorrows. Desiring to be rich, a love of money... This does not say we can't have money or we can't have wealth. But what is our desire? What is our love? We need to flee those who desire or love money. There are other passages in Scripture that teach us of things that we need to flee. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, flee also youthful lusts. He tells Timothy, flee youthful lusts, flee those things. We know the things and temptations that we had as young people. We need to flee those things. We need to grow up. We need to mature. Another thing, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 says, Flee sexual immorality. 
We should be fleeing from fornication, fleeing from sexual problems, getting away from those things. You know, we must also not just the acts, but we need to flee sexual immorality or fornication from our minds. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know, the world around us tells us it's okay to look. There's nothing wrong with looking, but God says different. We are to flee fornication. We are also to flee idolatry. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 14 tells us that. Flee from idolatry. And we understand that idolatry can consist of many different things. The Old Testament prophets got on to uh, Israel for their idolatry. Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Amos chapter 8, verse 14. Who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, As your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, that they fall and never rise again. You know, they were, they were worshiping incorrectly. They were worshiping false gods. They were not giving God what he wanted. And we've talked about that in Amos as we studied it. So when we talk about idolatry today... You know, we're talking about the same thing. What kind of worship are we giving to God? Are we giving God what he wants? Or are we worshiping falsely? We need to flee from idolatry, which means we do what God wants us to do. You know, sometimes the most courageous thing that we can do is to run from sin. Think back to Joseph in Genesis chapter 39 and Potiphar's wife cast longing looks at Joseph and she was trying to seduce Joseph and he did not heed her and it happened one time Joseph was in the house doing his work nobody else was around and she catches him by the garment so he leaves his garment in her hand and flees from the house we need to be like Joseph and flee from sin you know, this thought process that a lot of people have, you know, I, I don't know if y'all have seen this, but these places that have bar church, have y'all ever heard that? This is a thing. We hold a church service in a bar because it would be more comfortable for people to show up at a bar to have church service than it would be for them to go to a uh, church building. So we have church service in the bar. In, on that morning. How does that fit anything close to what God wants when he says flee from these things? Get away from sin. You know, I've heard people say, well, I go out with my friend because, you know, I, I want to be a good influence to him. I don't drink, but I go to the bar with him. Flee from sin. Well, we need to make sure that we are fleeing when we need to flee. Secondly, secondly, we see from this text that we have got to follow. We have got to follow. You know, but you, O oh man of God, in verse 11, flee these things, the previous things we just talked about, and pursue or follow righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Follow means, the, the literal definition of this word follow here means to pursue diligently. We need to pursue these things diligently. This isn't something lackadaisical. This is getting serious about living the life that we're supposed to live. Paul instructs Timothy here that he needs to follow after these things. The first of which is righteousness. Got to follow after righteousness. Well, 1 John 3, verse 7, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. We have to be a righteous people because God is righteous. So we need to follow after righteous things. Second thing is godliness. It's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. 
Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. We should want to have a um, quiet life, a peaceable life, a godly life. That is how we should want to live our lives. You know, we get a uh, instruction in 1 Timothy when it talks about modest apparel in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. In like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, with, but which is proper for women professing godliness, characteristic that we need to be pursuing. This is something that we, this godliness is something we exercise ourselves in. 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, but reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. We need to be pursuing it. We need to be exercising ourselves. This is great gain, according to 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. This godliness with contentment is great gain. We need to be pursuing or following godliness. Third thing we need to be following is faith. And we see that in Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. We have to have faith. And we know that that faith is a faith that works through love. Galatians 5, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. We have to have a faith that works through love, that causes us action because of the faith that we have. And that is a faith that we hold on to through thick and thin. Do we pursue faith? Then fourthly tells him, do we, does he needs to pursue or follow love? Needs to follow love. We see that, of course, where else would I turn to but 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when we talk about love? Starting in verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. And whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Love is that constant, and we are to follow or pursue love. That love that drives us to, to help those who are not Christians. That love that drives us to help those that are within the church that need our assistance. That love that pushes us to be closer to God because we truly love him. We need to be following love. We also are told we need to follow patience. Patience. You know, if we don't diligently pursue persistence and steadfastness, it will escape us. We talk about the Christian race, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You know, we can't quit when we start the Christian race and we have to have patience. 
We have to have endurance and be able to make it through. We need to be following patience. Lastly, we need to be following meekness. Meekness or gentleness. You know, Jesus was meek. He was not quick to retaliate when provoked. He was gentle. And that is a very noble trait. You know, meekness doesn't mean that we lay down and we roll over and we let people do whatever to us. It means that we are slow to anger, that we are gentle with people, and we don't push to retaliate. Those are all the things from this verse that we are told we need to follow as Christians. Well, number three. Number three, we are told that we need to fight the good fight of faith in verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. You know, the fight is like that athletic contest, that wrestling, that boxing, the, that, that physical contest. And Paul said he fought not as one beating the air. He says that in Hebrews chapter, no, the wrong way. There we go. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. You know, we, you see that, right? Have you ever turned on one of those boxing shows or one of those wrestling shows? You see those guys come out and they're doing all this, you know, they're just standing there just doing this. You know, beating the air. You're not accomplishing anything. You're not doing anything. You're showing off. That's what Paul's saying. You know, we, we're not showing off here. We're doing something with certainty. We fight for a reason. We fight for something sure. You know, we are in a life and death struggle with Satan. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You know, we are in a life and death struggle with Satan. Satan is going to throw anything and everything at us, but we have got to be prepared and we have got to fight. And we must use spiritual weapons in spiritual warfare. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We use spiritual weapons in this spiritual warfare, in this life and death struggle with Satan. But we are also told that we have to fight to uphold and to defend and to proclaim the faith. Jude 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. We have to contend earnestly for the faith with love for God and with love for the souls of men, for the souls of men and women. You know, we have got to be prepared to do battle. But we also need to caution ourselves and make sure that we are not fighting those fights that we don't need to fight. You know, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. 
He, uh, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. We've already looked at this verse, but it's talking about these men that are obsessed with arguments and disputes. These are fights that we do not want to get into. 2 Timothy 2.23, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. These are not what we are talking about when we talk about fighting the good fight. We're talking about standing up for God's word, fighting against Satan, but not getting into these type of foolish disputes. We have to fight. Lastly, lastly, we have to focus. We have to focus. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. You know, we get into our lives and we get over time. Sometimes it, it can be easy to forget what being a Christian is all about. We get into the, you know, showing up in our routine for worship and going through the motions. And we seem to sometimes forget that Christianity is about spending eternity with God and with all of the people of God. You know, this is why we make the good confession as referenced in, uh, reference in chapter 6, verse 12. This is why we are baptized. This is why, as Revelation 2, verse 10 says, we are faithful unto death, as it tells us. We are faithful unto death. This is the reason we do it. It's why we keep the Lord's commandments until he comes. Chapter 6, verse 14, here in this section. We need to make sure we don't forget what Christianity is about and we don't lose sight. You know, Jesus made the good confession before Pilate. John chapter 18, starting in verse 33, says, Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into this world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus answers here, Pilate, and gives that good confession. And we know that Jesus is the object of, of our confession. Romans 10 verse 19, but I say, did Israel not know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. Hebrews 3, 1, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Christ gave himself for us and he is the object of the confession that we make. You know, though we can't literally see him who dwells in light, unapproachable, but with that eye of faith, we can keep him in our line of vision and we can look forward to him. Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. He is who we need to revere and who we need to respect. Revelation chapter 19 verses 15 and 16. We have to keep ourselves focused on the goal. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. We need to make sure that is our primary focus. That is what we are looking to. That is what we have zoomed in on. That needs to be the most important thing in our lives. Is God our focus? 
Because if God is our focus, we are going to flee sin. We are going to flee Satan. We are going to pursue or follow all of the characteristics of God. We are going to fight for him. And then our focus is going to be on Christ. You know, I appreciate people on a day like today who come and get together and worship God. Why? Because that means God is our focus. Regardless of the weather, regardless of the things going on around us, we are focused on wanting to do what God wants us to do and being together. We should be focused on pleasing Him. Are we serious about being a Christian? Well, if we are, we need to make sure that we are doing the things in this passage of Scripture. We are fleeing the things we need to. We are following the things that we need to and that we have our focus in the right place. If there's anything we can do for you this morning, please come as we stand and sing.